Often I hear of the reality check that a lot of people don't seem to understand about their life. That they feel as though somehow, oh, I can do it. I can, you know, kind of like fudge here and maybe kind of squirm there and kind of get away with it for a while because nobody's looking, nobody knows. So you go ahead and you kind of like do your own thing for a little bit, you know, and you just think, well, nobody can see what I'm doing here. You know, nobody saw that. Nobody knows. So they kind of got away with it a little bit, you know, and they figure, oh, that wasn't so bad. So they go on with their life, you know, and they they kind of do the Christian thing, you know, they're over here, you know, doing, doing the righteous thing, yeah, you know, and they're celebrating with the Christians, you know, and telling people, oh, yeah, you know, Wonderful, wonderful, yeah, yeah. God bless you, be at peace, you know. And yeah, you know, we, we, oh, of course we all agree. You know, we agree to this, we agree on that, you know. We do this and we do that. And when nobody's looking, nobody's paying attention, nobody knows. Just a little bit. Not much. And of course, you know, then go right back to, yeah, hey, praise the Lord, you know, everything's fine. Yeah, you know, I'm doing great, you know. But are you? You see, this is a cup. It's an interesting cup. It holds your life's experiences. And you get to pour into it whatever you want. You can take a little bit from here, you know, a little bit from there. Matter of fact, you could probably take a little bit from anywhere. And everywhere. And the fact of the matter is, you're the one filling your cup up. You're the one, depending upon what cup you have, will fill your cup of iniquity and sin, or of peace, love and joy, and of kindness, of gentleness, of meekness. Ooh, smells a little rough. Whoa, what have you been putting in that cup? Has it been, you know, works of righteousness which God told you to do? Whew. Or have you been indulging yourself in your own little play and ploy, doing what you want to because you have the freedom and the grace to do whatever you want to do? Ooh. I think the Lord said, taste and see that the Lord is good. I don't know what you've been putting in your cup, but... Ugh, don't taste so good. You think maybe you need to start over? You see, God said that He takes these vessels and He pours them out. And He's been storing His wrath for a long time. You. And that one day, he's going to, when the cup is full, pour it out upon the earth. Yeah, that don't sound so good. Well, your life, likewise, as a Christian, is the same way. You're filling up a cup, and it may be a vessel of honor, which, praise the Lord, when the God takes a vessel of honor, he goes, Oh, wow. Yeah, there's a little sin in there, but you know what? This is my vessel of honor. I'm going to pour my grace upon it so it overflows. Ah, smells good. Mmm, tastes good. That's my vessel of honor because even though there was some sin in it, my grace covered what little bit of sin was in the vessel. Oh, but what if there was a lot of sin and only a little bit of room for grace? Well, smells funny. Looks funny. 
taste funny. What are you filling up your vessel with? Now the truth is, you'll be saved as though God has given his life for you. But is that really how you want to enter into heaven? Barely saved, you know, just kind of like, you know, squeezing in, just kind of like, you, you, you kind of made it, but really, you know, some of you didn't. You're willing to risk what type of vessel you are? Vessel of wrath, vessel of righteousness, vessel of honor, vessel of selfishness, conceit, desire, perversions, sin. We all are vessels. And God created us to be one or the other. The choice is yours. To the left or to the right. Your life's experiences are what God is going to taste of. I wouldn't want him to spew you out of his mouth. Because we can taste and see that the Lord is good. Master over the believer. You call me Master and Lord and you say, well, for so I am. Our Lord never insists on having authority. He never says, thou shalt. He leaves us perfectly free. So free that we can spit in his face as men did, so free that we can put him to death, as men did. And he will never say a word. He'll die. But when his life has been ceased in me, or create, but when his life has been created in me by his redemption, I instantly recognize his right to the absolute authority over me. I recognize that he is Lord, I am not. It is a moral domination. Thou art worthy. It is only the unworthy in me that refuses to bow down to the worthy. Whenever a person tells me, well, Jesus gave me authority, I always look at them as, no, he gave you the opportunity to give that authority back to him and let him be Lord over your life. But you chose to take that authority on yourself. And you chose to usurp his Lordship. For every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You have been given freedom and a lot of people exercise that freedom any way they want to. And often do that. They'll take control. They'll take authority. They'll say, I command you to demons. They'll say, I command you to Christians. They'll say, I command and I have this authority to do certain things. Interesting. Interesting. And yet Jesus did not exercise his own authority. But rather he said, the Lord rebuke you. Interesting. When you seek utterly your utmost for his highest, you choose to lay down your life for his glory. You choose to give up your freedom for his authority. You choose to not exercise dominion and power and might, but you give it to he who can judge wisely and accordingly do as he sees right in his sight and not ours. It is only the unworthy in me that refuses to bow down to the worthy. If when I meet a man who is more holy than myself, I do not recognize his worthiness and obey what comes through him, it is a revelation of the unworthy in me. God educates us by means of people who are a little better than we are, not intellectually, but holily, until we get under the domination of the Lord himself. And then the whole attitude of the life is one of obedience to him. God has given us certain people who have experienced some things that we look up to. We look at men of God and we say, wow. And we learn from them until the time we learn from Him. Notice that we learn from them till we learn from Him. So there's always a balance of the two that's going on. Learning from others who have experienced what we have and may give us insight into things that they're directly seeing but we learn from him as we grow and mature in the likeness of God himself. 
because it is his spirit that teaches us and guides us to the place of knowing him in a personal and intimate way. The revelation of my growth in grace is the way in which I look upon obedience. We have to rescue the word obedience from the mire. Obedience is only possible between equals. It is the relationship between the father and son, not between master and servant. I and my father are one. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. The son's obedience was a... Oh, the son's obedience was as redeemer, because he was son, not in order to be son. <laughs> that sounds confusing, I know. The reality of what... I want to say Tozer, but it's not Tozer. The reality of what Chambers is saying is that because he was a son, he obeyed. But had he not been a son, it would have been obedience. Because a son recognizes the loving request of the father and chose to follow the father's will when he could have been disobedient and rebellious, as a child does. But because he was a son, he accepted the Father's ability to know better than he did, though he was equal, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. He chose to suffer for us, that we would have an example to be likened unto him, so that if we were given authority, if we were given ability, if we were given these inalienable rights people talk about that the Constitution supposedly says, you know, life, liberty, pursuit of happiness, all the carnal, worldly things that you could have in this life. If we have freedom, then would we not choose to give up freedom for obedience? If Jesus suffered the things that he went through and learned obedience through them, is it not also your calling to obey because it's better than sacrifice? To obey as opposed to do your own thing? To obey as opposed to be your own person? To obey as opposed to say, Lord, Lord, and not do the things he has said? 